Good evening, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to all of you here for our next edition of the Anahita Speaker Series for Women. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Anu Singh, and I'm Deputy Director at Carnegie India. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Carnegie India before we move on to other things. Hello, I'm so sorry. I think Anu is having some technical issues. So I'll just take over and make the introductions for her. So um, my name is Samya Singh and I'm a research assistant with Carnegie India. Uh, welcome uh, to 2021's third edition of the Nahita Women's Speaker Series hosted jointly by Carnegie India and the Vedika Scholars Program for Women. Um, to tell you a little bit about ourselves, Carnegie India is a New Delhi-based think tank with deep analytical uh, research focused on three areas, security studies, technology, and society and political economy. Um, this research has become even more significant at this time of global crisis where so many of our previous assumptions are being uh, debunked. So perhaps uh, this is the time for us to rethink, reimagine, and even re-aspire. And, and this also the context for the relevance of the Anahita speaker series. Uh, in this series, we have the privilege of hosting a woman leader who has excelled in her field to share her professional and personal journey. What makes it even more special is that she is in conversation with a younger woman at the threshold of her career. Uh, with this, I now hand over to Nandini to introduce the Vedika Scholars Program and our speaker for today and the run of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Soumya, for that. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series hosted by Carnegie India and the Vedika Scholars Program. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce the Vedika Scholars Program and then welcome our special guest for this evening. The Vedika Scholars Program for Women is a one of a kind 18 month residential program that contextualizes management studies with a liberal arts lens. The curriculum has been crafted such that it prepares our scholars whom we see as women with potential to meet the world of work with 21st century skills and attitudes that are in alignment with the expectations of employers today. It is our mission at Vedika to create a cadre of professionals and leaders who will pursue fulfilling careers while all the while aspiring to break the proverbial glass ceiling. At the core of Vedika's belief system lie the twin values of diversity and inclusion, and we hope to leverage these to create a better and more equal society by participating actively in the global movement to empower working women around the world. And so it is with pleasure that I introduce our speaker for this evening, who exemplifies the ideals underpinning our mission, Paramita Vora. Welcome, Paramita. Thank you. Paramita, has, Paramita has worked extensively with themes of empowerment and feminism. She's a filmmaker whose work explores love and desire, urban life and popular culture. Her work has been broadcast and is taught internationally, and she's also been exhibited at the National Gallery of Modern Art, the Tate Modern, and the Wellcome Trust. She is the founder and creative director of Agents of Ishq. She has also written the screenplay of the award-winning feature film, Kamush Pani. Her film production company, Paro Devi Pictures, is based in Mumbai, and she writes a column, Paro Normal Activity, for the Sunday Midday. She also wrote a weekly column for the Mumbai Mirror. A very warm welcome to you, Paramita. And without further ado, I let Shruti now take over. Shruti is one of our scholars, and she will be interacting with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nandini and Soumya. I'm really glad to be talking to Paramita, ma'am. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to ask the audience to leave their questions in the chat box on Zoom or on the comments section on YouTube, so we'll be able to take them up. Uh, Ma'am, like, so to begin, uh, we recently did a documentary storytelling, a really short course at Vedika. And there was some like principles of documentary storytelling. And even the sort of main documentaries we saw were very stoic. 
and followed those principles. But and I had the uh, opportunity to watch Cosmopolis, and it included Bollywood clips, goddesses. So it was really different. I wanted to know how you have sort of like considered these conventions of documentary storytelling, and inculcated them with your storytelling. So I mean, I guess um, first of all, thank you for having me here. And you don't have to call me Matt. Please call me Paramita. And so I think you know, a documentary films is a is a strange kind of uh, film field in a way because it comes often preloaded with an expectation that it's going to be about politics in a certain way, right? Uh, and I don't think that anything is not about politics. I think everything is about politics. So it's also a strange thing that we think of documentary as being the place of politics. And especially in India, fiction film is not the place of politics. I think today we see a lot has changed, but this was definitely true some time ago. And then the other thing is that anything that is pleasurable that is enjoyable or fun, there is a huge prejudice that it can't be a serious thing. That if you want to say something serious, you have to look serious. And if you're saying something uh, in a colorful way, or if you're being funny, then that me obviously means it can't be a serious thing, right? So these are sort of like, it's a kind of a caste system of uh, what we think matters or doesn't matter. It's a hierarchy that is created. And I think that when I started working in documentary, I started working in 1990, uh, just a year before economic liberalization. So in a sense, my adulthood got split between two very different Indias. And by the time I started making my, when I started working, this is the kind of idea of documentary I inherited that it's a certain kind of, uh, certain way of talking about politics. It's a certain form. Uh, you're not supposed to enjoy it. It's always supposed to be something that you watch with this stern face, you know, and at the end of it, everybody will go through the ritual of saying it's so terrible what's out there. But um, I think that by the time I started making films, many things had happened. One that uh, political realities in India had changed a lot. And uh, there was, an, you know, as opposed to a pre-liberalization time when people were very much involved with this idea of national politics, there was also a sense that there are many, many different kinds of groups of people. Uh, traditional movements have really been decimated by the new economic structures. And I don't think that the old ways of uh, creating political forms really was effective anymore. So I think people of my generation were really looking for a new language. On top of it, I had come to live in Bombay, which is not at all the kind of place a documentary filmmaker would normally choose to live in. I mean, Bombay is a city you associate with fe feature films. Uh, with business, with, with whereas Delhi is the place where many documentary filmmakers used to be, right? Uh, and I think that uh, somehow creating a new language of documentary in order to communicate to a new generation that was uh, examining politics in a very different way, uh, I think I needed to make an Indian language that was something people could relate to, something they would lay a claim to. But most of all, I actually wanted to make a film of the kind that I wanted to watch. Uh, I, I, did, I think it's very false to make a serious face to talk about serious issues, it just becomes a ritual and it doesn't really make you question yourself. But I believe that if you watch something with a lot of pleasure, with a lot of involvement, with a lot of engagement, with your whole body and your mind, uh, then it sort of enters you and it makes you think. And it's not a binary of good and bad and politically correct and politically incorrect, but rather it makes us think about our own lives in relationship to the political situation we are in, in a dynamic way but also in a, in a conversational way. There's no fixed destination. There's no schema of politics, right? Like if, if you've seen Cosmopolis, which is a film about buildings, which are only for vegetarians. And, you know, the film was made in 2004. And as we know now, it was part of a larger kind of a conversation about purity, about prejudice, about keeping uh, Muslims and Dalit people out of certain neighborhoods by using this excuse of vegetarianism. Right? So it was an entire cultural kind of um, phenomenon that occurred at the time that it's very hard to pinpoint. And it is told through the story of a slightly comedic conflict between the goddess Lakshmi and the goddess Annapurna, right? which are also two different notions of the city, two different notions of prosperity, but it's also kind of a funny film. Uh, and it's not something that you, but because I think that it's very easy for us to act as if we are progressive by saying that I'm against something. But if you really look at your own life, you'll often find many contradictions. Uh, and the fact is that when I started looking for a place of my own to stay in in Bombay, 
the broker asked me, like, what kind of a building do you want to live in? And I said, well, I want to live in a building where there are all kinds of people. And he said, oh, cosmopolitan. And I thought, that's interesting. There is also a category for those people who don't want to belong to a category. And so although we may think that we are absolutely tolerant of everything, maybe we have our own preferences. So the moment that I look at it from that point of view, not in an adversarial way, but in a questioning and exploratory way, I think it creates a different political conversation. And lastly, as an artist, you know, I don't think that uh, artists, what is I think amazing about artists is that they are able to intuitively know what is happening before other people come to know it. They can feel it in the air. They can sense in the small things around us, in the way that people are dressing, in the way people are talking, in the way, in the things people are liking and oncoming politics. And so I think in order to communicate what is not already known, you sometimes have to find new languages because the old language only accommodates the old reality, right? So if you want to talk about new realities, then you need new languages. And the arts are all about creating new languages. So I think as a documentary filmmaker, I still see myself as an artist. I don't believe in the separation of art from politics. Uh, I feel they are deeply intertwined. And so I think all of those things were really uh, part of what I was doing. Thank you. So like, I definitely agree. I think especially today, because of the political climate, we also see at least in mainstream Bollywood, a sort of hesitance to approach politics that was very refreshing when I saw either Cosmopolis or even Ram Ke Naam, which were both documentaries. And uh, something that you said that really struck me was that when you were growing up, there was a sort of a, uh, like it was after liberalization and even today when we are growing up and we talk amongst ourselves we're in a very I guess difficult time and I think even we are using at least digital media TikTok reels to express that so I'd also like to ask you like how are you traversing between like these different forms be it filmmaking digital media writing for midday and uh, stuff like Priya's Shakti mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, you know, this, uh, I, I always joke that you know, it's, an, it's a kind of anti-purity thing, right? Like it's a queer, queer form of working that you don't stick to only one form. Uh, so you're always crossing the Kalapani uh, of form in a way. And I think, um, I think uh, these last 25 or 30 years have been times of a lot of tech technological shifts, right? I mean, uh, first we went from film to video, from video to digital, and then the whole world of the internet opened up. And I think every one of those digital shifts has brought different kinds of people into the conversation. And it has also made different kinds of conversations possible. The other thing is that for the longest time, uh, because modes of production were so centralized, it also controlled who could speak to whom. So for example, as a documentary filmmaker, I always was in a marginal space where I couldn't speak directly to a general audience uh, or my audience was perhaps pre-decided that you're going to make a film and you're going to show it in certain spaces. And moreover, if you make films the way that I made them, I mean, like people in the beginning, especially, but even now uh, would say, this is not a documentary. Like you've got lip sync songs in your documentary or you've got these fake ads in your documentary. You've got fiction, you've got nonfiction, everything is mixing up. This is not what it's supposed to be. So it was also difficult for the films to go to film festivals or to be in all the traditional spaces that documentaries are normally given importance in. But I think the amazing thing I found by making those films is that actually there is an audience for it. That audience is not the pre-decided audience, but like a, a large younger audience began to grow for those films. And uh, after I made Unlimited Girls in 2002, I spent a whole year only doing screenings, like constantly being invited to different places to do screenings, although the film didn't go to a single film festival. So I think that was a very big learning for me in what can be the relationship between an artist and the audience and how new forms of technology enable these new relationships uh, because they enable new languages. If I were making films in that old template of the political film, I don't know if I would have discovered all these new things, right? If I would have, because I made a film with a chat room in it, which was about feminism. Uh, I ended up showing the film in hundreds of colleges and knowing that people loved it. Otherwise, you know, everybody used to always look at me and say, you're such an intelligent girl. Why do you make documentaries? Like, is it boring cheese? Or is it marginal or bigger cheese? So uh, I just feel like, 
it allowed me to know that what I wanted to do was something that people could love. And it allowed me to grow in relationship to an audience. So it always kept my politics a bit fluid. It didn't allow me to fix myself in a hierarchy that I, the progressive liberal filmmaker, I'm going to tell you what to think about the world, you know, like most of the bearded men are always telling us. But rather, it was a much more equal relationship with the audience in which I learned as much from every screening as maybe people got out of my films. And it showed me the politics of pleasure, that when people enjoy a film, that film is not accusing them, but it is asking them to think. And it's a relationship of trust that you build. When you make a pleasurable work, you, you're telling people that I respect you and I'm not here to lecture to you, but rather this is what I think of the world. And I want to know what you think about these things as well, right? So I think similarly when the internet came, I mean, I was using the internet. So obviously it became part of my vocabulary and I wanted to explore all of those spaces. And uh, so I think, the great difference is that I wanted to make films which were made up of the things that I loved. Like I loved Hindi film songs. I I loved um, I loved Jason Toshima, the film that I kind of used as a basis of Cosmopolis's form, form uh, because it is like so dramatic and so colorful, and you know it was it was very campy also in some ways. But uh, I also think that. Uh, the languages that we love often, the popular languages, are the languages we are told are not serious and not to be taken seriously, but they're the language that people speak. And they're the languages that somehow come join us in an experience, right? So it provides a point of commonality. Uh, and so I think, you know, by the time that agents, or, or say when I wrote in midday, um, Tinaz was the editor, uh, had actually been my student and she asked me to write and I was like, there's no way I can write a weekly column. Like, there's no way I'll be able to do it. And she said, oh, just do it for three months and then we'll see. And it's funny because, you know, I just completed 11 years of writing that column. So I think that, uh, again, the column is in a tabloid. You know, everybody aspires to write in a national newspaper. But, and, I, and I guess it's nice because it gets you a very huge audience. But what I could do in my column in midday was write about anything and everything. I have written such complex columns in those 550 words. It made me a better writer. It taught me that if I want to say something very complicated, but in a way that more people can access it, I have to work hard to develop that language. Um, it would be the easiest thing for me to just not have to think about that. But I think it's great. It sharpened my thinking. It made me a better writer. And again, I discovered there's a huge audience for it. You know, we're all... so in in short, if I were to, I mean, the same when when Agents Fish was created, it's just that the social media was growing, and then it seemed like such an amazing place to reach people directly. Uh, and I think in every instance, the political learning, as well as the creative and even the commercial learning is that the old ideas do not see the new thing. The old idea of what is business does not see the new thing, right? It is somebody creative usually who sees a new thing and says, okay, I'll take the risk of doing it. And by creative, I don't just mean artists, but creative minded people in any field often have that kind of insight into uh, intuitive insight into what people are feeling and they don't mind taking that leap and that is how they blow open a new landscape right so i think in all the instances of working with new forms or even with priya shakti which is a comic involving augmented reality um i learned a lot of new things sometimes i did it just to learn the new things sometimes i did it to reach a new audience uh, and mostly because I thought through this form, I can, I can communicate with people. So I think uh, the, the thing I learned is that even politically, you should not be quick to believe that things are like this only. Uh, you know, when every time that I make a film or I was start, when I was starting Agents of Fish, everybody said, nahi, nahi, ye to nahi, ye to nahi hoga. nobody, are, you can't talk about sex like this online. Nobody will pay attention to it, right? But that is not what happened, you know? And so I think... All of it is to say that when you don't see yourself as superior to the audience, but you see yourself as part of the audience, perhaps you also feel a little bit of what the audience is feeling and you think like, well, I want this, so I think other people want it too. Uh, and I think politically too, intuitively, if we allow ourselves to be guided by the things we believe in, rather than what we are told we should believe, we are much more likely to come up with new political solutions and a more vibrant political society. 
Thank you so much for your answer. And I also think that your stress on new languages and not simply preaching to your audience, I we can like see that in the content of Agents of Fish. It's very fun. It's almost like, you know, you're talking to your friends about sex, boys, love and all that. But in that, I wanted to ask you, um, especially with Me Too, there has become sort of a thing that you need to divulge your trauma to mm. get someone to sympathize with you. How do you approach that while maybe curating content or editing content for um, something like Agents of Fish? Hmm. It's a complicated question. We could be discussing this for about five hours, but I will try to answer it in brief. I think, you know, um, uh, I mean, Me Too happened like when about halfway through uh, the life of Agents of Ishq. We started in 2015. Um, and um, I think that uh, speaking about trauma, uh, it's it's a very difficult and important thing. Uh, I think we all know that what Me Too achieved is just the ability to confront a reality that everybody had known and to insist that this reality is not okay, you know, uh, to, to say that, no, stop telling me to just ignore it or it's not such a big deal or a really strong woman knows how to cope with whatever adversities come in her way. And it put the onus on the structure. It, it point, pinpointed behaviors that are not, you know, they are not according to me I think the missed opportunity in our conversation about Me Too is that we've spoken so much about the sexual uh, abuse and trauma of it that sometimes we leave out a little bit that it's also a huge amount of everyday sexism that people face, right? Or or everyday homophobia or transphobia. But and that Me Too occurs in structures which in which there's all kinds of bullying and all kinds of power relations involved, you know. So very likely that in a space where there is sexual harassment there's also other kinds of harassment and that these are structures which put uh, upper caste upper class cis straight men at the top of the pyramid and then they say that we should all aspire to be in that form or no and no other form right so that's the only definition of success so it creates an inherently difficult structure to work in so i think that it's important while talking about one's trauma to also guard oneself right because we often think that when we talk about trauma our trauma will be over but our trauma is over when somebody hears us and the system responds to us and what we've also seen is that doesn't always happen and that very often people's narratives are then used in order to create clickbait or they're covered in a certain way and that leaves the person who has experienced a trauma kind of neither here nor there uh, so i think that for us at Agents of Fish, when we thought about it and we thought, how should we respond to this moment? You know? uh, I think that you would have noticed uh, that Agents of Fish actually does not follow these binaries, but rather it's a space for reflection. And uh, so around that time, we did a collaboration with our friends who were at the Ladies' Finger, a feminist zine, and uh, we invited people to tell us their stories. Their, their most memorable, their, their, their biggest memory of sex, good, bad, or indifferent. Because we also wanted to say that there are many, many experiences that people have sexually, right? And there are many, many ways in which people deal with it. Otherwise, the Me Too narrative was getting pulled away uh, and uh, being turned into, well, then these women should file police cases or these women should do this. Otherwise, they are just pretending. If they're not willing to go through the legal system, then they're just faking it and, you know, just trying to get attention. But that's actually not the fact. So taking it away from other people telling you what it should be and creating more and more space for reflection and for actually Agents of Wish centralizes the narratives of queer people and women uh, in order to remake our imagination of the world. And so it was also providing another way of thinking about sexuality, consent, and relationships, separating the workspace and the personal space, the whole granularity of those interactions, creating a space to hold that trauma, right? In a way, because we have to, we have, to have a place to move to beyond trauma at some point. How do we imagine that place to be? So we do think of Agents of Ishq as a space that allows those imaginations to prosper. They're not our imaginations alone. They're imaginations co-created with the audience because uh, 
about 70% of Agents of Ishq is co-created with the audience. It's user-generated narratives. It's people responding to us. It is us constantly listening to what people are saying and changing along with the audience. So in a sense, I really think that uh, the internet and Agents of Ishq as a project has allowed us to understand what it is to work along with the subjects rather than make something with subjects. Like in a documentary film, you bring in people and you film them. And you might think of ways of co-creating and having a more equal relationship. But I think the internet, it has allowed us to let people be anonymous if they wanted to be. It has allowed them to speak about their experiences with complexity. And also uh, the idea of women and sexual consent is rooted in the idea of women as sexual beings, right? If you don't accept that women are sexual beings who might want to have sex or not want to have sex, I don't think you can understand consent. So I think we did a lot of work to try to strengthen that idea, that idea of women as sexual, as beings with sexual agency who make their decisions about sex, right? So otherwise we, we just have this story of, you know, the binary of the Asha Bhonsle versus Lata Mangeshkar binary, right? The good girl who never wants to have sex versus the, the bold girl who always wants to have sex. But actually there are all kinds of people and we have to learn to look at women as sexual beings and then recognize that their sexual consent matters. So I think these are some of the things that we did in that moment. But I must also add that we also did invite, like, you know, we did a, a small survey. We, we asked men, how has me to change the way you think about yourself? And it was interesting to see that some men had a very negative response, of course, but there were many who were questioning themselves. And that was, that was good to hear and to provide a platform for them. Yeah, I also think I asked the Me Too question because on Agents of Age, there are a lot of um, articles about sort of the like the gray areas of consent that even when the movement was happening in India, when they were coming out, a lot of people were like, is this really punishable? Is this really, would you call it rape? Would you call this abuse? So I found, and I also found that Agents of Fish had a very intersectional approach. It didn't only focus on upper caste cis women in India. It did focus on trans women and uh, lower caste women. So that was also really interesting. So did you, uh, did you begin with the idea of having an intersectional approach to feminism, especially at Agents of Ishq, or did it develop over time? At Agents of Ishq, it was always there. I would say that for me personally, it's something I learned over time, you know, because I certainly didn't grow up with much understanding of it, but a few things happened. I mean, uh, that when I made my first film, in fact, an older feminist colleague said, I really liked your film, but I was just thinking that you didn't talk about caste, you know, and the women who do this work, that they belong to certain castes and and I said, oh, I didn't think of it. And I'm so grateful to her because she said, well, you know, that is an important factor actually of that particular thing that you've done. She didn't shout at me, <laughs> but once she said it to me, and I think that's why it's so important that somebody says it to you in a way that makes you think and makes you learn. I never forgot it. You know, after that, it was always part of what I was looking at and thinking about. Um, but I think I also I began to think about, is it really like, you know, it's just representing people the way of being inclusive, uh, or does it in fact create exclusions in its own way? So for my own, in fact, even my own, as you grow older and as you become a little bit more successful in your work, you understand very much what the barriers are, right? When you're very young, especially if you come from, you know, a middle-class, upper-class background, have gone to good schools and colleges, your parents don't stop you from doing things you want to too much. Right? you think that you have a lot of possibilities. I know there are not so many barriers. It's only as you start working for some time that you begin to recognize how many barriers there are. And, you know, uh, when we were preparing for this talk, somebody asked me, what is, what is the biggest hurdle you face as a woman? And I said, the biggest hurdle I face as a woman is that people keep asking me this question. What is the biggest hurdle you face as a woman? Instead of asking me about all the amazing things I might have learned or done, you know, taking my experience seriously as an experience rather than reducing me only to that token identity. So I think those learnings made me think hard about what is the way in which we can have inclusive forms. So even when you asked me earlier about that Bollywood inclusion or inclusion of popular culture, right? A lot of it is about changing, your, changing the lens on how you look at form, which is considered to be better or superior, more intelligent, more meaningful and seeing that actually these are hierarchies, you know, and that the fact that people think TikTok is vulgar 
this is just a very puritanical gaze on actually a very libidinal and fantastically energetic and a different kind of intelligence that is operating in those forms, right? So I think by the time that Agents of Ish happened, it was uh, like there had been many years of learning from other people and thinking about these things. There had been many conversations in the outside world that had also been learning conversations, right? Uh, so I think it's important in that sense to be curious about what other people are doing and saying so that you can keep learning from it. And at Agents of Ish, I think even the, the name, no, Agents of Ishq, when we came up with it, the idea that Ishq is neither love nor sex. And that it's some kind of an in-between experience or it's both or either or something, you know. Uh, and, and we asked people the question, do you want to be an agent of Ishq? But we didn't tell them what it meant to be an agent of Ishq. So everybody defined it in their own way when they responded. And these are frames actually. So what we've tried to do is find frames that are inclusive so, for example, desire is an inclusive frame because everybody experiences some kind of desire, but we're not telling you which desire you should be experiencing or not be experiencing, right? So it allows people with different experiences to enter in one space. And um, it creates, therefore, an, at least an equal starting point for everybody. So no matter what, who you are, your experience is yours. You are the expert on your life. And you are speaking about that. So experientiality is another inclusive frame that we are not asking, like we don't take cultural commentary, we don't have opinion pieces, it's people talking about their experiences. So I think these frames are inclusive at the same time, and they do invite people of many different backgrounds, right? And all of, so we are not actually differentiating between queer narratives and straight narratives and saying one is in a special box, but we're saying these are all human experiences of intimacy. And these are different kinds of wisdom that people have arrived at. Uh, that said, I think you also have to be mindful that there is diversity in uh, the kinds of people who are coming in. And if there isn't, can you do something to engender that diversity? Maybe you can approach people, maybe you can change something. Um, so we obviously do seem to prefer a form in which we don't outright, you know, do things on the basis of identity, but we also are even if we don't do that in our communications frontally, but we're always mindful of it and then searching for ways to include anything that gets left out uh, in some way or the other. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I think I really um, related to when you said how your lens expanded and you sort of started including different experiences and how you didn't want to uh, reduce inclusion simply to representation or tokenization. And uh, I also like, um, usually, I don't know, people uh, who focus on issues such as this are reduced to like women filmmakers or women issues pay filmmakers, but like there are a plethora of issues that are gender centric or even beyond gender. And mm -hmm. I think it's really commendable how Agents of Ish is exploring those. Uh, so I think now we can take some audience questions. Yeah, I'd like, uh, so Drishti is asking, do you think that audiences in tier three cities have become more open to talking about sexual empowerment and topics around sex through agents of Ishq? Um, I think uh, we've, I don't think that people were ever not open is actually my, you know, I think that the binary of rural and urban not tier two city and uh, metropolitan city, these are created by some people and I don't think that they apply that hard and fast when it comes to matters of sexuality and personal choice. Uh, and uh, the reason I say this is because we can also find very conservative narratives in cities. And uh, Agents of Ishq is not, although it exists on the internet, it's not purely born of the internet, right? So uh, there is many, like all the years that I've had the good luck to uh, meet people working in feminist organizations or doing different kinds of work on the ground have really helped us to also create material in partnership with them. So for instance, we made a film along with Sneha, which is an organization that works in Dharavi. And we, may, we made a series of podcasts in partnership with Khabar Leheria uh, in Chitrakoot. So in fact, if you listen to the podcasts that have been created in Chitrakoot, Lucknow or Dharavi, I would say they are so much franker, so much more direct and so much more, uh, I would say at home with the entire emotional world of sex and with talking about doubts and confusions without the, you know, the woke 
woke infrastructure of language in a way that you find a lot of urban people using. So I think that what has happened is because Agents of Fish always started out being in Hindi and English, and we always used a kind of English in our English in order to invite more types of people. Our audience from tier two and tier three, tier three cities has steadily grown uh, over, over the last five years, but that also mirrors how the internet has grown, right? Like internet penetration has also grown in a certain way. Um, yeah, but, and so I think that in general, people are more open to talking about these things now than they were five years ago, or more people, let me say. I think that five years ago, there were fewer people. They were also saying more radical things in some ways. Now there are many, many more people. And sometimes they are saying they are still at, a, at certain starting points. But yes, there are a lot more people, certainly, from everywhere. Uh, I could also, I think I can understand when you talk about how woke language, like in a bit to be inclusive, might actually be exclusive, uh, excluding people. Uh, the next question is, it's from Nandita. She's asking, can you tell us why you started Agents of Ishq? Um, well, because I think uh, post the Delhi gang rape in 2012, there had been a lot of conversation about sexual violence. But one of the things that we were seeing was that the only way in which sex was spoken about was in relationship to violence. And it was underlining uh, this idea that women are fragile, there's an aggressor out there in the public space. And we, I was uncomfortable with the parallel conversation it was creating. It was becoming about protecting women rather than about women's freedoms or the freedoms of queer people or anybody who's not. Like it was creating a new conformity and a new elitism, right? Because you were also all the time saying that uh, respectable women are under threat by men when you go outside. And then there were a lot of content creators online who were making videos which always showed the guy who doesn't speak English properly, you know, the, the working class guy, uh, the guy from the small town, the guy from uh, who doesn't seem to be upper caste is the one who's always dodgy, right? Like there's always this joke, not that friendship, I'm getting all these badly spelt messages, as if to say those were indicative of some kind of sexual degeneracy. And that means that the guy who speaks good English and looks suave cannot be a predator, right? And what has Me Too shown us? It has shown us the limits of that language that grew at that time. So I think Agents of Ish was created in order to really say that that's not the conversation about sex that we need to be having. We need to be having a conversation about sex that is inclusive and not creating fresh hierarchies. And that's definitely not rooted in purity and protection. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is that I think, yes, there's no sex education. We've many of us suffered from that. Uh, sex education cannot be defined only in terms of biology. It has to be defined as comprehensive sexuality education, something that looks at sex as a part of life, part of politics, part of society. And we need to create a language for it. And Agents of Ishq, I think, was its primary desire was to create a language to talk about these things on the internet, because internet is the home of sex. It's where everybody goes to find out about sex and often to find sex, right? So we wanted to be in that place. And lastly, because it, it felt like it could be a marvelous creative project that would really make people feel better that would help people to be comfortable with themselves and learn to respect other people while really enjoying the arts. It was an opportunity to use art to dignify life and experience. So yeah, these are all the reasons we started. To have an Indian language to talk about these things. The next question is somewhat connected to this. So Anya is asking all sensible conversations about sex in the mainstream media focus mainly on sexual violence and trauma. Why do you think that is? Um, I think um, talking about sexual violence and trauma is uh, comfortable because it makes you look like you're concerned for women without really challenging the mainstream framework in any way, right? So if I talk about sexual trauma or any trauma, or any difficulty, then it makes me look like I care. But if I do some kind of an investigation into sexual harassment laws or, or are people enforcing policies in their workspace and all that, that doesn't, that doesn't seem so dramatic. And that makes me question the status quo, right? So I think that this is something to watch out for, that 
People like to report on difficulties as a way of underlining that life is very difficult and you should stay within your limits. So it's it's a kind of morality tale sometimes. If I, I heard a lot of young women say in 2013, 2014, like, oh my God, are you going home alone at night at 2 a.m.? And I'm like, it's Bombay. I've always done it. I mean, that's like Bombay ki khasiyat hai that you can do it, right? But the idea that the outside space had become very scary, I feel like these kinds of narratives do reinforce that. And we should be careful about the way in which these notions are reinforced rather than actually challenged. The next question is from Rahul. So he's asking as a documentary filmmaker, how does one ensure that one's own biases don't shade the voices of the subjects? By ensuring that your biases are uh, uh, understandable to the audience in the way that the film form is used. I think it's a very important question because to pretend that you don't have biases uh, is, is a foolish enterprise. We all have biases, we all have preferences. And those are the things that are our worldview at one level, right? And so this does go back, I think, to the earlier, the first questions about form. Why do we create different kinds of forms? Because we are in creating a form, you're communicating who you are. You are communicating your viewpoint, right? The moment that you do that, you're saying that it's only one type of viewpoint. When you don't use these pseudo objective formats, then you're saying that I have a highly subjective viewpoint. And actually, I am talking to this person through that subjective viewpoint. So your subjectivity must be made clear. And I think the creative forms remind people that there is an individual who made this film. It's not like some generic progressive character who has made this film. An individual who seems to be this kind of person, you know, has made this film. And so I should take everything this person says through that filter. It doesn't mean that I have to doubt you, but it allows me to have a relationality with the filmmaker, which is not of absolute acceptance. And then like in some films, I'll give you some examples. I, in, in, in a film, I interviewed a woman uh, who considered herself to be very independent and forthright and feministish person uh, about, uh, about being a feminist. And she said, well, you know, I believe in equal rights, but I don't want to be like those women who go 50 kilometers away to protect women and but I'm not selfish like that. And I'm, whatever. And then I got angry with her. So I said to her, that means you are very selfish, right? You only care about your own self. And then she said, um, yeah, I am very selfish. I, I don't think it's selfless to go and talk, you know, do more chai and whatever. Now, the thing is, I had got irritated with her. It would have been very easy for me to edit that with just having to say, I am very selfish, which is what a lot of people that do stuff on the internet do. But while we were editing, we discussed it and I kept my questions. I kept the whole interaction in. So you as the audience do have the right to say that, well, the interviewer was pretty rude to that woman and the interviewer is coming from this place. So yes, I think making your subjectivity transparent helps that a lot because you're no longer uh, making a disembodied interview. You're not saying that this person is own, this person has done this interview in response to you. They may do a very different interview in response to somebody else, right? So, yeah. I think that's really interesting because when I used to work in media, I think the first thing they used to tell us was be super objective, both, both sides. Also, I could see that approach in um, Cosmopolis. I for, I'm forgetting the name of the woman, but the one who was vegetarian and who didn't want any Muslims or anyone in her neighborhood. So I could sort of hear you feeling angry in the on the camera side. Uh, the next question is from Ajaya. So she's asking, what has proved to be the most powerful medium in creating awareness amongst people about sexual desire and pleasure of women or normalizing it? How do people react to the content that is created? So uh, I, I don't think there's any one powerful medium. I think there are powerful ways. And I think the most powerful way is by creating multiplicity. You know, when you said earlier that we are told, oh, uh, be super objective by showing both sides. Are there seriously only two sides to any story? There are not. There are at least a hundred sides to a story, right? So it is not possible to, like the moment that you reduce sides to a for and against, you're creating a binary and an adversarial relationship with everything, um, which is a kind of a zero sum game at some level. But if you're exploring a question, it's different. So if you're exploring the question of sexuality, the first thing has to be that there are thousands of ways of experiencing this thing. There's no one definition of sexual liberation. Sexual liberation is the ability to understand your own sexual nature and to have some ability to maybe actualize it in the way that is comfortable for you and not violating somebody else's rights or 
safety, right? So I think that to, that uh, the the medium of people uh, contributing their own narratives has been very powerful, um, but it has been powerful because we have worked to take it away from that confessional mode to a reflective mode. We always ask the people who write for us to reflect on their experience and tell us what they have got learned from it so that it becomes a shared community wisdom for the people who are coming to Agents of Ayesha. And I think that the response that people have had is that every story opens up questions in people's minds and it makes them join the conversation sometimes, sometimes not, but in their minds they have and they are thinking about their own lives and that's really very important. I think when you don't act like there are only two sides, you don't get into this for and against business. So you don't enter the conversation on sexuality to tell other people their sexuality is wrong and your idea is right, which I think a lot of people tend to do um, or say that, you know, people of certain kind are sexually backward and people of certain kind are sexually progressive. I don't think that applies. So I think when you don't do that, it is powerful. And the other thing that we found very powerful is, of course, we make music videos. And I think music videos, I think music and songs and Hindi film songs and dances, they are a really powerful medium of communication because they are about all the things that are, cannot be said precisely in words, but can be communicated, right? So I think, yeah, these are the things. And uh, I would like to say that, you know, Agents of Ishkin, oh, it's over five years of existence has, we have not been trolled or run into that kind of uh, expected negativity. And I think it's because we don't take the adversarial position, but it's more inviting to a conversation. Uh, speaking of the songs, I really love the Garden of Love and Consent song. It's really good. And it was really refreshing, refreshing to know that you haven't been trolled because I feel like that is such an expected and disgusting response these days. Mm -hmm. uh, Richa is asking, you spoke of visiting multiple schools and talking about agents of Ishq. More than wanting to know about the reactions of young girls, I wanted to know how did young boys perceive these conversations? Did you notice and uh, did you notice a change of any kind? Yes, I think that you know uh, uh, talking to boys uh, and men is is hard. Uh, on Agents of Ishq, we found that to be the most intractable population, very hesitant. The number of men who sometimes write saying, "I want to write a piece for Agents of Ishq," but never actually finish writing it, is quite high. Whereas often queer people, I, I'm talking about straight men, but queer people and women are much more forthcoming and want to talk about their experiences. And it shows you that there's such a lack of language uh, for, for heterosexual men, especially to talk about intimacy and to, to be honest, right? So I would say online, we frequently have the experience of men wanting to give lectures. And I feel like, yeah, please, you know, they're always wanting to tell you what you should do, you should do this or some, some speaking in these kind of, uh, cliched certitudes but when you are actually on the ground and doing things with people it's a bit different because there is a tendency even then uh, to make fun of things to try to joke away the issues um, to insist that they know the answer to everything but if you persist a little bit in the conversation there is also vulnerability there is also pain there are all the human experiences that human beings have um, and in some workshops that we were able to do where we had uh, different genders in the room. Uh, I think what really was nice was when people told their different stories, like especially when some of the young men spoke about say heartbreak or rejection at a very emotional level, it created a lot of mutual empathy. Uh, and once they were able to do that, they were also able to listen to the women talk about their experiences in a non-defensive manner. So I think we all know that there is a need for a new conversation, uh, new language for men. Uh, and I think one can make some invitations, but eventually that step has to be taken by people themselves, you know, and it's taking them a very long time, slow learners. Uh, but I think that, uh, yeah, on the ground, I would say that there is, there, is, there is a shift in that there are more young men who do want to talk about some of these confusions. Um, and we should open out those conversations about the difficulties of online dating and uh, the difficulties of changing. What is it around them that prevents them from changing, even when they're doing things that essentially are not, not working out for them. It's not like being a jerk is working out for anybody much anymore, you know, but why are you unable to abandon those behaviors? I think those conversations are starting. Yeah. And yeah, definitely. And I think 
rather than men feeling threatened, there should be more encouragement of there being spaces of empathy and where they can be vulnerable. The next question is from Ishani. Um, she's asking what kind of audience does Agents of Ishq have right now? Are there attempts to create content aimed at diversification? Because there's a lot of English content. Uh, is it enabling or a little exclusionary? Uh, she's also adding that Agents of Ishq Ish is one of her favorite social media handles and thanking you for creating such a space. Thank you very much. I'm going to do the work from home thing and quickly open the door because I live alone. So one second. <laughs> Um, so uh, the kind of audience for it, no, the English, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think the English is exclusionary. In fact, I think it's more inclusive. You know, one of the things that we do when we edit in English also is that we always say, don't use kind of complex sentences that very, like people who speak English as a first language will understand. But no, I, it's, called, it's English, Hindi and English. Yes. Yeah. yes. So I'm saying that even when we have plain, like plain English, even then, we edit it to be a kind of English that is not going to be understood only by first language English speakers, right? And the English, I mean, yes, if you don't know Hindi, then it could be like, there isn't that much English that a non-Hindi speaker can't get the English. But certainly, you know, we don't have the language capabilities to have dozens and dozens of languages mixed into the English, or it would be great if we could. It really depends on who's writing and who comes in. There's also that. Um, I think that the audience for Agents of Ish, at, uh, right now we are at a, like a, not 50-50, but it sort of goes between 55-45 uh, women to men ratio, uh, because these are the genders the internet allows you to see. But my sense is that, of course, there's a lot of uh, young queer people that follow Agents of Ish, but we've seen a rise in men in the last three or four years, which are three years, I'd say, which is good. Um, as I mentioned earlier, more audiences from different places, a lot more Hindi speaking people, we began to get our uh, first, you know, Hindi contributions, because we translate a lot of stuff, but our contribution that was straight in Hindi began to come around uh, two years ago. So that was great, great. When the first one came in, we were really excited. Yeah. Um, you know, we do this annual masturbation shairi contest in May. Please participate if you haven't done so, so far. Uh, and every year, the number of languages in which the entries come has been growing. So I think uh, that, uh, and I do think that our audience is still more metropolitan, but it, it is growing to be in tier two and three cities steadily. Uh, the next question is from Ajaya. Um, this is the last question we'll be taking. She's asking, is there any theme you would want to cover in your next film docu slash documentary, which you haven't touched on yet? <laughs> um, I think, um, I am, actually a theme that I'm really very interested in is dance, which is not a theme that I've touched on at all. And I'm curious about, curious to do something with dance. Um, but it would be wrong for me to say that, you know, I mean, song, dance are two big preoccupations of mine. Shah Rukh Khan, you know, these are things that I think about a lot, have talked about a lot. So I do think that whatever I do forthcoming will have something to do with these themes. Um, I, I just think that the next thing that I do um, may be a little bit different in, different in form, uh, uh, in the sense that mostly I do things which are very spread out across a lot of like, you know, it's very eclectic, the thing that, but I might do something which is a bit of a deep dive next. Yeah. Yeah, I hope we get to see Shah Rukh Khan in the movie too, whatever you do next. Oh, that I hope so too, but I don't think that's going to happen much as I would love it. <laughs> I hope you get to dance with Shah Rukh Khan. That will be great. Oh my God. It's my dream to dance with Shah Rukh Khan. Yeah, I think Anu is here to get the, to give the thank you note. So I think we'll have to end the conversation there but it was really great talking to you thank and you, i you. got to learn a lot about how to like further be, be a better intersectional feminist and uh, look at inclusivity and other things in a different light thank you so much thank you thank you paramita i'm not here just to give the vote of thanks <laughs> i have been watching uh, in complete fascination 
a wonderful conversation. And what I have come away with is, uh, you know, um, that the underlying theme or what your mantra seems to be fluidity, whether it is fluidity in language, English, uh, or in, um, you know, um, gender, your definition of gender, your definition of desire, experience, and form, most of all. So uh, I think binary is uh, something that is anathema to you. And that, that's been the most fascinating uh, part of this conversation for me. How, how, you know, again, like you said, there are always many more than two angles to everything. And so there are many more than two, uh, two um, or, or they're endless to everything, whether it's a form that you choose to explore or it's an experience or people's experiences, how to even look at something, which, you know, till, till now had been pretty straightforward for me, which was sexual predation, this whole violence and sex. But uh, uh, yeah, I will look at all of these things differently. So thank you. It's been an eye opener in thank so you. many different ways. And I'm so sorry for having dropped off so dramatically <laughs> at the beginning. Oh, you're the times. <laughs> I know. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, okay, I don't think my video is starting, but Paramita, thank you so much. This has just been amazing. And I must say, as an older woman, um, I would probably a candidate who is very uncomfortable with talking about my sexuality. And I'm wondering whether there is space for women like us who probably don't want to talk about it and where do we fit in this spectrum. I feel very often out of space with um, the youngsters that I interact with because of my inability to have this conversation. And I'm wondering whether it's because of my background, uh, questions to ponder on. And one mm. of my takeaways, probably my prime takeaway was the fact that in organizations and industries, we spend so much of time working so hard at being inclusive. And it's not just about women, but all forms of inclusion. And something that you said, you just ask a particular kind of question, like, do you want to be an agent of ish? And the right kind of question, again, I use the right, uh, the word right with uh, <laughs> a lot of caveats, but a certain kind of question in any organization, in any space, probably just naturally creates inclusive frameworks and we probably don't need so much of you know think tanks and all of it just allowed for questions to flow and organizations then generically within you know our own spaces we will create frameworks that don't have book language that don't have othering by default and my journey at least at Vedika will be because it's part of our creed is to look for these sort of questions that our scholars can go ahead and ask and be creators of inclusive frameworks. So thank you so much for that. I have to get onto Agents of Ishq. Thank you. Yes, you should send us a story. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God, I'll have to dig into my deepest dark. <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> thank you so much. For All right, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,